All right, call the meeting to order. Welcome to our public board meeting, February 28th, 2012. We live in interesting times. Um, have adoption of the regular board meeting minutes. Move to adopt. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? And that is carried. Uh, adoption of the agenda. So moved. All those in favor? And that is carried. Uh, report out. We, uh, the board did meet in any camera meeting and talked uh, uh, personnel and financial matters. Uh, before moving into the management report, um, I just want to uh, say a couple of things um, around some uh, additions um, to our table and some uh, losses with uh, with in our working relationships with uh, with the board. Um, uh, starting with Janice Wright. Janice Wright has been uh, the QP president um, for many years and uh, isn't here this evening, um, but is uh, well represented by uh, QP. I just wanted on the behalf of the board acknowledge um, the years of service that she put in as the as the QP president and uh, the, the strong working relationship that she's had with uh, the, this board and the boards in the past. So on the board's behalf, uh, thank you, Janice. Um, also want to acknowledge that we have our new secretary treasurer, uh, Mr. Horswell, who is here this evening and uh, will be uh, taking over the reins from uh, Mr. Ron Amos, who did a yeoman's job in um, filling the breach between uh, Mr. Ibs's departure and, uh, and Russell's arrival. So uh, welcome, Russell. Thank you. And, uh, on behalf of the board, thank you very much, Ron, for your outstanding uh, work and uh, in the months in between. Thank you. Madam Superintendent. Thank you. Um, through the chair and to everyone in the audience, um, it's always my great delight to start a public board meeting with good news items. And as I've mentioned in the past, we have so very many of them, we kind of have to sort of have wait lists and try and get everything on one sheet of paper. So I'm not going to read through um, the document that you have in front of you. Um, there's, there's a number of things that are going on in our district uh, that are taking our children to uh, different districts. Uh, the Destination Imagination, uh, you'll recall that um, that was an initiative that uh, really came to fruition last year, and we ended up, um, to the great delight and surprise of many, at the uh, global competitions in the Destination Imagination last year. Um, much, and we were novices, absolutely rookies. Our teams were rookies. We have, um, it has become such a vibrant part of our school community that we're sending 18 teams to Campbell River this weekend to compete in the regionals, and our teams um, should do very well there. Actually, we have very strong, we're known on the island as having very strong teams as our school district and our teachers and our uh, students and their parents have embraced the destination imagination model. Um, many other things on that item, but what I'd really like to spend my two minutes on is um, the reason that some of us who should not normally choose these colors, like I'm not a woman who should wear this color by choice, but I am certainly proud to wear it, um, as are everyone else here in the room. Of course, tomorrow is Anti-Bullying Day, February 29th. Um, it is a provincial-wide initiative, a, uh, a national initiative uh, now, and certainly an initiative that our district has embraced. Um, there are activities going on in every single school, from elementary to secondary. Most in, in most schools, it's an all-day kind of adventure with a variety of things for students to participate in. Um, and, of course, the message simply for us is that we are trying to um, make our to help our students believe that bullying um, should not exist in their world and that we all have a responsibility to make that happen for them. And we can focus on... Uh, the fact that bullying does occur in schools, um, and I would not say to you that it doesn't, and that we do what we're working hard to make sure that we address it and that we're dealing with it, but bullying goes on outside. And so as we model as adults for our children that bullying is not something that should be happening to them or anyone else, we need to be conscious that bullying goes on amongst adults, in homes, in workplaces, and in the world at large, in the power play between adults and adults. Um, which is what really bullying is about, we need to be vigilant that we're modeling the kind of behavior that we want our students to. So that's a big part of what we're working on tomorrow. And the only, um, we have a list on our website, I believe, of all the activities, and if you're connected to a school, I'm sure as a parent um, or as a staff member, you know that there's all kinds of ways for you to be connected to this. We want it to not be a single day item. 
And so one of the, some of the projects that are uh, either coming to fruition tomorrow or are beginning tomorrow will be year-long kind of adventures for students and staff to participate in. But I would like to just share with you as my final good news item some news about how adversity creates honor and integrity and celebration. So what I'd like to point out to you is that tomorrow um, on YouTube will be the launch of a uh, the final fruit of a project that began out of tragedy in the valley in the fall uh, where students were looking for uh, places to go to find community again and to feel good about themselves and to celebrate the lives of some of their peers that had been lost and we recall the time the difficult time we had this fall in our high schools across the district and some students at Vanier were looking for something to do that would be meaningful and that would uh, highlight the positive things that go on in their lives. They managed to, long story short, managed to brainstorm that they'd like to make a video and worked with the staff at Vanier and with myself and we sort of brainstormed over what that could look like and in the end what, it, what occurred was a partnership between Vanier students and Shane Poison, our national slam poet famous, of course, the gentleman who opened the Olympics with a poem about, the, about Canada. And he gave his time, he stopped everything and came to the valley, and over the course of the last three months has worked with Vanny students to produce a video with an original piece of his work about building community and not being alone. And, and it's a celebratory piece. It's stunningly beautiful. And that will be released professionally by his company tomorrow as his tribute to the anti-bullying campaign and as his tribute to the Colmux Valley. Additionally, so this is about a six-minute video that's on YouTube. What we will release tomorrow as well is a 30-minute video made by the students of Vanier that is probably one of the most moving pieces of film you as a, a person might, might see because it speaks to... It speaks to the valley and it speaks to building community. Uh, I will, uh, we're going to post it on our website. Uh, it'll be on most school districts' websites, and certainly you'll be able to see it probably through the YouTube link as well. And it features a piece of music written by a student that was just stunningly beautiful. Jan Sprout wrote this as part of how she was processing loss. And so I would encourage you to take the time to uh, to have a look at this video. And it, spe it, it, is the speak it speaks to the making of the video, but it is about how the community gathered to help students make this video. And the underlying message is, is you're not alone. There's always someone out there for you. So that is our final piece of Anti-Bullying Day, and we would encourage you to have a look at that and to share it amongst anyone you think might be moved and touched by it. And I think there'd be very few people that wouldn't be. So that's my good news. Thank you. Um, before leaving that um, section, I'm asking you to move on to your uh, student achievement report. Uh, I have the great pleasure as the board chair on behalf of the board uh, to publicly uh, acknowledge and uh, thank two of our um, finest contributors to our district, uh, Mr. Paul Berry and Mr. Steve White, who are joining us this evening. Gentlemen, could I ask you to stand? <laughs> and I'd like you to turn around and look at the camera. For the seven people that are watching us this evening. <laughs> Um, uh, both Paul and Steve were recently recognized, appropriately so, by the Comox Valley Chamber of Commerce uh, and received their uh, Citizen of the Year Awards for Mr. Barry and Hero of the Year Award for Mr. White. Um, and we are extremely proud and grateful um, of the work that you have done, continue to do uh, within the school district. Um, your um, shining lights of what um, what contributions uh, individuals can make to communities and as, as a board, as a district, we're extremely proud and grateful for your contribution. So please, on our behalf, take our thanks. And finally, on my, on my portion of this item, if I could ask... Um, um, Director of Finance, Mr. Ron Amos, to, um, we had the very great pleasure of um, being asked to participate in the celebration of the transfer of the, um, of the Halby Hall to the Black Creek Old Age Pensioners Association, and Ron, Ron participated on behalf of senior staff and Trustee Caitlin's there as well.
Ron, can you just describe yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the honor and privilege of trustees Kate McDonald and Selby were here if they're in attendance. And uh, with the old age pensioners, we've had, a, we've had a leasing arrangement over the past, I think, close to 20 years with them. So uh, we were finally able to pass over the, uh, the ownership date as it were. So that was the official ribbon cutting was registered with the scissors work and everything else. And uh, it's interesting because you go to these social events, um, it's a lot of uh, obviously older people, and you go into the so it's, it's it's less about the ceremony and more about the social context. So you go into the next room when they have a coffee and, and goodies, and that's there's a lot of as as common to you know, the trustees. There's a lot of experience of cooking in that room. Some you could tell by the baked goods and everything else, but um, it was actually uh, like I said, well received event. Um, very appreciative crowd, and uh, yeah, we just had a yeah, at the assembly and representing the board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just if I may, and um, I don't want to chase either of you gentlemen out of the room, but you do not need to feel compelled to sit here for the whole evening. <laughs> <laughs> for the record. <laughs> So moving on to the next item then. May I do that? Please. Thank you. So um, on page eight is uh, two trustees and to the members of the gallery is um, the, uh, I think, I believe it was in November, I spoke to um, the fact that historically um, superintendents were responsible to, under legislation to report to the ministry on achievement, usually by December 31st, but that the ministry was in the process of actually revamping the reporting structure and I may have spoken to sort of um, the hollow nature of that reporting structure previously and that the ministry was looking to streamline the process and originally um, for a variety of reasons we were originally told that we weren't certain that we'd actually be reporting on the, uh, this way and then at the very last hour the ministry came up with this very streamlined template which is a mini version of what we have historically done at the end of June which is a very final report. So this is my mid-year report on a template that is new that only allows, I just have to say this out loud because uh, inspe uh, Inspector Douglas, because Director Douglas was making fun of the fact that I hadn't filled in all the spaces and that's a surprise for someone like me because I talk so much. Um, however, this particular template counts your keystroke and you can't add any more than what this is. So the feedback from superintendents has been that this isn't a particularly great template and we're hoping that we would be allowed to say what we want to say in the future. But what this is, is a summary of what we, what we have been working on uh, for the last year and a half. Um, it is meant simply to be a summary um, and it just I wanted to just highlight it to you for two reasons. One is that I'm putting it in front of this new board um, late and I, it is late and I have permission to be late because this board is new and it did not seem fair for me to present it to you on your inaugural meeting of swearing in in December. Um, that didn't seem because you were just being sworn in and then as we were they were struggling with the template in December in January it seemed that uh, we had um, that that was when they were deciding whether or not we needed to actually submit it or not. So in front of you is simply something that is not new news. This is basically the condensed version of the district achievement contract and report that is on the website that I wrote in June of last year, June and July of last year. What I'd like to highlight to the public and to trustees is the areas that we are right now required to report on and they are um, in the new and improved version. They are around achievement, the identification of challenging areas, uh, the kinds of things that you would normally expect to be contained in a report like this, performance results and intervention. Um, but there are some new things that we are expected to report on, which I think is refreshing and, and I think hopeful. We are expected to report in our achievement contract on Aboriginal education. And a new category, uh, which is new in terms of legislative requirements for school districts to be responsible for children in care. And so I would take just for interest sake, um, turn you to page 11 of this report where we were asked to summarize the work and our efforts in meeting the needs of children in care and for those of you who might not be aware of this the ministries of children and family and the ministries of education have a protocol now that shares children in care and the responsibility for reporting it's new um, never, we've never done this kind of work before it's healthy in many ways we think that we as we are the sort of the 
the educators of children in care, we want to be able to report and have a reporting relationship with the people who are their guardians, which are the Ministry of Children and Families. And so this is the first time we've really reported on this. Um, and there's, it's, it's a little bumpy around data collection and um, tracking because it's new. We've never ever tracked and partnered with a minis another ministry before, but it's working well in our valley particularly, we believe. Um, and it's got some bumps in other places in the province. So Section 5, Children in Care, basically speaks to how we're reporting and what the, how we're developing a relationship with MCFD and how our students are actually doing. And it's important to understand that children in care are children who are full guardians of the Ministry of Children and Families, not children who are in temporary custody uh, situations or in foster custody situations. So you would expect that that's a uh, large enough group of students in our district but it isn't a, a very, you know, a super large group of students. So right now, we've they've identified uh, the Ministry of Children and Families 45 students, and we were reporting on them. There will be give or take one or two students um, at various stages in their guardianship that we report on, and we might report on them one report, and then they are no longer guardians of MCFD in the next report. So the numbers don't always add up specifically, but that's something that I just thought I would bring to your attention. And of course, as we move to full day. Um, kindergarten, there will be an expectation that we continue to report on the early learning section. And that's new for districts to have to report. You'll see a much, when they, de when they design it um, and give it to us, you'll see a much, much more broader, more fuller version of the superintendent's report coming out at the end of the school year. So to your attention and for your endorsement, if I could ask, um, as for a motion to endorse, not to approve, but to endorse my report so I can send it to the ministry. Yes. I make a motion that the Board of Education endorse the mission of the 2011-2012 Superintendent's Report on Student Achievement as presented. We have a seconder. Second. Trustee Van de Porta, thank you. Any discussion? Um, I have a question and then maybe a comment. One is that uh, under the early learning section, this says that we are a WTK district. Welcome, welcome to kindergarten. Welcome to kindergarten. Thank Sorry. you. I, I also I don't know what an SLP is. Student learning plan. Thank or you. No, I'm sorry. It can be two Spe student learning plan or in this case speech language pathology. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I guess I. Sorry. Jargon. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I have one question, if I may. Um, and perhaps not for this report, but for the final report, where there are references and just an example under challenging areas, uh, number two. Mm -hmm where it says FSA results due to low participant rates on average 50% more students opt out than the provincial non-participation mm -hmm. rate. Um, would ask to some consideration for a, a number that that relates to because it's 50% yeah. of, yeah. so I don't know if that's a yeah. big number or, or a little number. Uh, okay. So just there we have that would be great. Okay, uh, no further discussion. We'll call the question. Or all those in favor. And, and that carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will move to the inaugural Secretary Treasurer report. <laughs> That's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just a procedural um, information before we dive into the uh, annual operating budget, and that's just to review the School Act on the passage of bylaws. Um, the, uh, my understanding is the school jurisdiction is, in the past has read out all of the bylaws for each of the readings and um, section 68.3 of the school act um, does not require us to do that. What we need to do is uh, read the title and it is provide a description of the bylaw provided everyone in the audience and, and the board has a written copy of it so we can expedite the reading of a bylaw a little bit. It's not too bad on a budget bylaw but some of the other bylaws can get fairly long in doing that. Um, a second clarification on the uh, reading of the bylaw is uh, we are able to do to provide all three readings of the bylaw, provided uh, the board uh, adopt a, a motion that would uh, indicate that we're going to provide all three readings at this meeting, and it needs to be carried unanimously. So you have in your agenda uh, three draft or four draft motions. Uh, three of them are are providing the reading, and then the the, the third motion is the one that would require unanimous approval, and without the unanimous approval, we would have to defer this to the next meeting, and that's problematic because the budget is due in a couple of days. Um, 
So on uh, pages 14 through 22 in your in your agenda is the amended annual budget for fiscal year 11-12. On page 21 is the actual amended annual budget bylaw. It is a total amount of $75,643,715 million. And page 22 is a detailed summary of, of the changes. Um, in essence, our, our projected revenues are up approximately $356,000. Our corresponding increase in expenditures um, are up $366,000. We have a slight increase of our op projected operating deficit of $10,000. Um, in the amended budget, we are projecting a, a shortfall of $401,956. Now the board has had an opportunity both in our uh, in our trustee orientation and training session to to go through the the budget in detail. Um, so it would not be my intention to to do that tonight. Um, however, if the board has any questions, I certainly and and Ron can uh, attempt to answer them. And it was also discussed the, the finance. Yes, well. correct. Thank you. And uh, there are minutes in the uh, in your package uh, board agenda for later on. The uh, finance committee also considered the offering. Are there any questions for students? We have a motion. So, the way they are here? Yes. Okay. That School District 71, Pomox Valley, 2011 2012 amended annual budget bylaw in the amount of $75,643,700. And fifteen dollars receive its first reading. Another seconder. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? And that is carried. Now I understand from your earlier explanation we don't have to read it. You do not have to read it. That's correct. Uh, the description is the um, the, amended budget. the amended annual budget um, in the total amount of seventy-five million six hundred forty-three seven hundred and fifteen dollars. Or do we have a second reading or referring? If it's easier to read, just read. Just read. I think I'll read just out of habit. That school district 71, Comox Valley, 2011-2012 amended annual budget bylaw in the amount is 75,643,715 receive its second reading. We have a second reading. Okay. Trustee Graham, thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is carried. Okay, I'll read the next one. This is when we have to read, correct? Yes. Okay. That the board unanimously agreed to suspend the requirements of the School Act in Board's Procedural Bylaw 2007 to have the third reading as a subsequent meeting. I have a seconder. Mr. Coleman, thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? And that is carried unanimously. School District Number 71, Comox Valley, 2011-2012, amended annual budget bylaw in the amount of $75,643,715 receive its third and final reading. Second. Second. Trustee Grinham, thank you. Any discussion? None. All those in favor? That is passed. Thank you. Thank you. And the Secretary Treasurer, over to you. Lori Village, Senior Administrative Assistant at Miracle Beach Elementary, will retire effective June 29 after 16 years of service. Pauline Dawson, Administrative Assistant Highland Secondary, will retire April 20th after 21 years of service. And Charlie Shatterton, the uh, teacher has been on long term uh, leave, uh, retired January 31st after 31 years of service with this district. And all those retirees will be honored at the board uh, retirement function. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Marie. Okay, yeah, motion to. Motion to receive management's report. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. We're on the board committee reports. Trustee Graham, Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we held a meeting on Monday, Mar uh, 
February the 13th, 2012. Um, we are responding back to the letter that was um, directed to the Finance Committee uh, from the Board. And our recommendation is that the Board's uh, Chair write a letter to uh, Steve Stanley, the CDTA President, stating that the Finance Committee has reviewed his letter and due to no short-term solution in the budget, we will consider the issue of class size in the 2012-2013 budget uh, process. And I think so. Anybody seconder? Trustee Coleman, thank you. Any discussion? Well, I'm just wondering what the impact on well, I suppose we will still discuss those issues, but clearly the government has some remediation program they're presenting about class size as well. But, but that will just affect what does happen in the budget. Yes, yeah, we would change that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? Discussion? Well, it, it just that the, um, the, the new Secretary Treasurer advised us that our, uh, our um, reserve was... Uh, only moderate in his estimation for a budget of our size. So the reserve funds that might have been used for other things are clearly, if we're going to be careful, not available to us. And I think the other, the other issue is, is that, um, you know, you know, there's a number of things to consider. Space is one of them. Uh, space in schools, obviously, is, is, is an issue. Is there an empty classroom? Uh, and the other one is that I don't think was addressed in there, but uh, it's probably an issue. Is this other adults in the classroom? So there's a number of things, but uh, if the board is uh, looking at that for the next year, uh, what are we going to cut? And I mean, that's the reality is, is that uh, what's, that's part of the budget process right now, and we're going to have to have a serious look at it. So at this point, just for clarity, what's being recommended is that the request that came from the CDPA president is deferred to the budget discussions around 2012-13. Correct. Any further discussion or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion that's presented? All those opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Uh, the second thing that we have is this committee membership, and it is the recommendation uh, that the director of finance, uh, Ron Amos, and other senior staff, as required, be included in the finance committee. And the process there is to have a more rounded process as far as um, a monthly budget process, annual uh, budget, etc. So that, uh, and that we have also included a couple of other things on that. Finance committee, so uh, it's, it makes sense to uh, add those other senior staff. So that first part was the motion. First yes. Part was the motion. Okay, do I have a seconder for the motion? Second. Thank you, Trustee Payton. Any discussion? Is there anything else you want to add? Sorry, Rick. No, that's okay. it. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. And the third thing was um, um, we had a discussion in regards to the Budget Advisory Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, and I'm not, I didn't do the research on this one. Uh, there's not a policy, but it, it was my understanding that it was appointed from year to year by the board. And um, our recommendation and motion is that the board dissolve the Budgetary Advisory Ad Hoc Committee for the year. 2011-2012 school year, and that the finance committee be responsible for the budget. Okay, so, um, no. so you, so you went past what you thought. Okay. There. Do you want that added on, or do you? No, we don't. We don't need to add that on. It, it's it, it's just expected. Just as written. Yes. Okay. Do I have a second? Trustee Coleman, thank you. Any discussion? Yes. Um, with respect to the, um, the budget coming up in the process and that, at which time will the Finance Committee be um, sharing that information with, uh, with the Board and that as to the process of the finance as a budget and how that will happen? Yeah. Uh, we've already uh, 
last month that we set out the uh, schedule. Uh, and certainly uh, the budget will be coming back to the board to deal with. It's not the finance committee to deal with it. It's, it's, the, it's the board, but uh, there's a number of schedules uh, of dates that that will be uh, starting in March for the process with partner groups. Before you go a second time, is there any, any other trustees have a comment or question? Okay, it's more of a follow-up. The information you gave us was a tentative schedule. Yes. When will the definitive absolute schedule, this is when we have them regarding the process of the budget and that to you, Mr. Chair, as to who asked that. Well, um, the Secretary Treasurer and I will be working on that and we'll be uh, sending out an email with those updated uh, dates. Um, I have just one question. Um, with the, um, the dissolving of the ad hoc committee, which um, in theory and to some degree in practice allowed for the encouraged the input from others, um, um, what safeguards are there in the system as we move forward to ensure that um, those who have comment and opinion will be able to... Well, there's actually a couple. First of all, we've asked uh, that there be a link on the uh, website uh, so that both staff and the public uh, can comment uh, on the budget process, and we will uh, be putting the budget on on that link as well. And so uh, we are. Uh, our feeling is is that uh, if history proves itself, a public meeting is generally six or eight people and generally half of them are staff. Uh, so we don't get a large turnout for a uh, budget review. Uh, and we're hoping that by uh, using the, um, the website, uh, that may encourage other people to uh, speak about the budget, things that they feel are, that uh, we either have not addressed in the budget or they feel passionate about. And we will take that time to, to review that process. And we've also ensured that uh, each of our partner groups will have an opportunity uh, to sit down and go over the entire budget and have an opportunity to make presentations as well. So we feel it's a fair process. Okay. Seeing no other hands up, and, uh, call the question. All those in favor of the motion as presented? And that's fair again this way. And that's my report, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Need to move and receive. Need to move and receive. Sure. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? <coughs> Unanimously as well. Policy Advisory Committee, Trustee Shelby. Um, we have a meeting on February 7, 2012, and the minutes are attached. We have three policies to rescind. I move that the board rescind policy 5012 retirement, policy 3011 meal time breaks, and policy 3016 criminal record search, and 3016 R1 criminal record search employees as present. Do have a seconder? Second. Thank you, Trustee Amaporta. Discussion? Or perhaps explanation? <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll leave that up to the function. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, it's actually, uh, we as a policy committee are reviewing a, sort of a list of policies that are outdated. And not only outdated, but are actually outdated because they exist in either legislation or collective agreements and really have become redundant to policy. So the group had a considerable look at a number of them, and these are thus far our recommendations. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And then it's carried unanimously. Thank you. I want to move receipt of your report. Uh, second. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Grinham. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously.
Thank you. An update to education committee? I don't have a report to report tonight. Our last few education committee meetings have been used for trustee orientation and governance. We have a tentative date, possibly March the 13th, as a possible date for our education committee meeting. If we choose to go forward with that, we will announce it on the website and connect with our community partners on that one there. But we've been using our meetings for governance, updating on finance, working together as a new board, and their senior management in getting a handle on what's happening in our district, which has been really, really positive. I thank senior management for giving us that education. It's been really wonderful and well received. Thank you. Thank you. There is no real report. Excuse me. Pardon me? Excuse me. Excuse me. Fire hall. Fire hall. There's no report, so there's no report. Transportation committee. Trustee McDonald. Yes, so the minutes are here. I would like to note that these are draft minutes in a way. They haven't gone to the committee, and we're going to work on that protocol so the committee does have a chance to just see them before they get into the package here. It's really important. But what we are bringing you at this point is a proposal from our discussions of the priorities that we would be looking at, our strategic direction. I think that these felt like tasks, which within the committee's mandate as it stands makes sense to do some work on. There are, and you'll, you know, reading this, recognize that the committee is trying to identify the places where we're dealing with management reporting to the committee on their specifics of our busing and other transportation programming and places where the committee is addressing some governance issues, policy, public outreach, and trying to get clear on that. So we'll probably be doing more work around our mandate as we go along, but we felt that we could identify these particular strategic directions. The issue of looking at policies around who's being bused, et cetera, we feel over the, they are going to need to be addressed, but some of that information will be evolving as we see developments in 21st century learning. So we're not going to be tackling them head on as it notes the timing's not great, but they'll be on our mind as we move forward in seeing how does this particular part of the board's operations tie in with our educational, our educational program delivery. So we are looking for support at this time or for at least a direction from other trustees that you support what we've identified as key work plan items. Before, I hate to come across as a stickler, but as the, you're suggesting that they're wanting that these minutes are draft. It feels inconsistent for us then to pass a motion on a draft agenda or a draft minutes. So we can receive the report. There was the strategic direction part was circulated back to members for comment and received support that we would go ahead to bring it to the board for it's hopefully a recommendation that the board would approve the strategic direction. It's the minutes itself that haven't gone back to our committee for, for any kind of approval. I will make sure next time that the committee members have had a chance to see the minutes before they're included in an agenda. Because the strategic, the four key strategies are identified in the minutes as well. And then it's the overall strategic direction. Okay. I guess my, my request is if, if that the minutes should come as, as finalized minutes as opposed to draft minutes. Well, that would be my preference too. Absolutely. But we just had a little procedural glitch in this case. So there's a motion before us. Yes. The support that the board accept the strategic direction submitted by the transportation committee. Second. Any discussion? Discussion? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay. Just that I'm on the committee, and our Secretary of Treasury did pass these minutes out to us prior to review them, so I think the committee did see them. And basically, it's for information, so I'm happy with the format that we've had, and maybe part of our governance session we can discuss that. But the Secretary of Treasury did pass these out to us, and we did peruse them, so we had a chance to look at them, and they are reflective of what we discussed at committee, so I'm happy moving forward on them. Well, somehow I didn't receive them, but I did receive the strategic plan, but I didn't receive the minutes, so I'm then speaking from an incomplete piece of information, Janice, and I'm so glad you got them. My comment is on the strategy. I think that the four areas that you've identified are excellent areas. Certainly, number two, city transit coordination. It makes a lot of sense from a transportation perspective, and also provides some flexibility for some of our senior students, high school students in our school district. But I also see that number four, and you've already identified it, that 21st century learning transportation effects, and what that's going to look like. Good luck with that one. Thank you. So, Trustee Coleman, you have your hand up. Just that I support the strategic direction, and I will continue to support them even when they come in as formal minutes. Thank you. Any other comments or discussion? All right. All those in favor of the motion as presented? Carried unanimously. Thank you so much. We move to receive the report. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Board appointees and other bodies, committee structure, Trustee Gambacorda, DCSTA, DCPC, Trustee Orientation. Yes, we, February 9th to 11th, we were at the new Trustee Academy in Richmond. It was attended by Trustees Selby, Grinnem, Caton, Coleman, and myself. We had two sessions with Davis Campbell, who is a senior research fellow at the Center for Applied Policy and Education at the University of California. Really fascinating speaker. He broke down what the trustee is about and their role and the board's role, and it was very informative. We had a candidate speech from the Honorable George Abbott, which was also entertaining. And also with Judith Clark and the legal role. So it was a lot of learning, a lot of listening, rounded out by a really good game of Jeopardy, learning the history of the SBCSTA history of negotiations and stuff, and we came in third. Out of 40. Actually, we could come in first except for Secretary Treasurer. He lost a couple of questions for us. I had to guess. I always pick C. He's from Alberta. He's from Alberta. Thank you. Thank you. For board information. The BCSTA Provincial Council, Trustee Caton. I attended the council this weekend, and I just have a couple of updates for everybody. Friday evening we had a lovely meeting with our Deputy Minister, Mr. Gorman. We talked to trustees about that lovely word, the budget, and the money. There is no more money coming. We were told emphatically there's no more money coming. The one thing that the government has done a flip-flop on is they've now decided that school districts and other governments can sell their assets. They want us to sell properties and lands, and they're encouraging us to do so. There's some pros and cons to that, and as that will happen, more information will come. I believe a letter will be coming to the board and the district in the near future as to their goals. They actually have a target every year. They want so much money actually earned, identified. They want X amount of dollars every year, and they don't have that number because it fluctuates. We were told like $44 million one year, $24 million the other years. They want actually revenue from properties being sold, so that's a target they actually want us to hit. We have some questions about that, and then when the letter comes to the board, we will have some more questions on that. The other interesting one is the word inviting, and inviting doesn't really mean inviting with the ministry, I don't believe, anymore. 
But they're talking about shared services, and they've invited 14 lower mainland boards to be part of a shared servicing program. It's a pilot program to look at how to share costs to save money, looking at district offices and how can you share services and cost and, um, and save money. And um, it's, it's going to happen. We were told the lower mainland is going to be the pilot project. And what school boards they have yet to identify, I believe there's 14 they were looking at as to who they were going to identify will be coming shortly also. And on Saturday, two things to note. Um, our trustee December Academy is not happening this year. In fact, we are actually having an academy in November in conjunction with the Superintendents Association, Principal Vice Principals Association, and BC ASPO. Um, it's called an educational conference where they're hoping each district will bring together a group of, um, of trustees, senior staff, um, um, teachers, parents to this conference, and that's a new thing that, that our board will be getting more information in the next month or two. That will be in November. And our BCST fees will be slightly increase, increasing this year. I think we'll pay $600 more this year than we did last year to run for BCST support services. So just some highlights of um, interesting, interesting meeting. Any comments or questions from trustees? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, new business. Secretary Treasurer, do you have the boys and girls? Yes, in your package on page 31 is a, a report from the Director of Operations on a request from the Boys and Girls Club to um, operate a full-time daycare program at Aspen Park School. Uh, the report summarizes the uh, consultation and the, um, the details of, of the move, and this would uh, uh, be moving an existing portable that we have um, from... Uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn School to the Aspen uh, Aspen Park School, and then there's a recommended motion at the bottom. Maybe the director of operations might want to yes. say more additional information. The additional portable is the uh, former Brooklyn Bandroom, and it's uh, currently the only surplus portable in the district. Boys and Girls Clubs uh, operate in the same with the district, and there's uh, a community need for additional daycare services for the. I'd be happy to move that the board approves the move and installation of portable to Aspen Park Elementary School for the Boys and Girls Club to operate a daycare. All costs associated with the move and installation to be borne by the Boys and Girls Club. I have a seconder. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Trustee Payton. Any discussion? Questions? Trustee Grinham? Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm more interested in the shape of the building, although it's not technically germane to the motion, but uh, is, uh, to Ian, is it, uh, what kind of shape the building is in? Portable. Portable, Portable was in reasonable condition um, when it was closed, and it's been maintained with heat um, for the last few months. So I haven't been in, in the building within the past month, but with the prior few And are you going to do any testing in there for the mold or stuff? We do regular you testing for all the portables. Okay. So any, any testing would be routine. All right. Thank you. Um, to you, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, to our Director of Operations over there, um, if there's any problems down the line, is the district held, uh, held for any cost problems regarding um, if there's any structural or anything coming along the line? Are we held responsible for stuff like that? All the maintenance of the portables is typically Services are typically borne by the provider and then we provide maintenance of the program if it's a school district resource. Tom, can I the, sorry, just, because just for clarification, the, the motion speaks to a move and installation is borne by. So it speaks to your comment that if there's ongoing structural things, those would be the district would manage those. Sorry. Well, this particular motion is a it's a culmination of uh, we've we've had some information before us before um, because the Boys and Girls Club uh, had worked with 
the Secretary of Treasury is to identify the site and get permits, and we're hoping to move the building from currently at Royston some time ago, and they were unable to do it because the building had been built by Vanier students and therefore didn't have a manufactured building number. And so they have been for more than a year wanting to be able to have that building and respond to the needs of parents in that area, and I'm so glad that there was the space available. They do have the funds already on hand to move forward with it, and it will be a good contribution to the flexibility of support for parents in that area. I have one question just for clarification, and maybe there's two. I've got one question. This is one portable at the Aspen School site. This isn't a second portable. Is there any part of the actual physical Aspen School building that will be used by the daycare provider? Is this an expansion of something? Well, they're currently doing before and after school care. In the? Within the school, and they'll have sufficient space to go through the day. So they're desiring to have two portables on site so they can do some community programming and some daycare. We will have two portables available for them. Okay, you threw me there for a second. So is the intent for the entire operation to move into that structure, or will it still so the before and after school will be in that site? Yes. Thank you. Trustee Hamilton. I have a question for you, Chair. Assuming that the daycare at Vanier, for example, has a fenced-in playground area at Cornish State and North. So there's a good site identified on the west side of the school for a secure bit of open space. And the principal thinks it can tie in quite nicely to the existing school. So there isn't much in the way of, I would say, younger student play structure because it wasn't home until the school. So I think they could collaboratively build something that would suit the needs of the school and the daycare. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Seeing no further hands up, I'll call the question. So the motion as presented. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you. Do I have a signing authority? Who should lead this presentation? The secretary. Well, he can't lead it. He can't lead it. I'll lead it. Let's go for it. I would ask the trustee to consider the motion on page four, which is to simply to the board delete Leonard Ince as a signatory for school district 71 Comox Valley and that the board authorize Russell Horswell signing authority for school district 71 Comox Valley. Let's move the recommendation. Second. Thank you. Any discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you. The correspondence. Let's see. Before you, the first correspondence, which is from Mr. Paul Ives, the mayor of the town of Comox. Motion referred to the transportation committee. Do I have a seconder? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Any questions about the letter? Yeah. It was paragraph three that raised an issue with some expectation by the town of Comox council in regards to the implementation, maintaining a crossing program to support the crossing of school children both before and after school and further. That raises a couple of issues immediately about lollipop ladies or whatever. By lollipop, you mean carrying a stop sign. Yes. Well, everybody knows what I mean. Not everybody. Okay. I think the ladies. But 
I'm really concerned about that because they, there may be an expectation here. And so uh, you're invited to, to uh, join uh, Trustee Coleman and meet with that council, and I hope that you raise that issue that uh, it's a financial issue that uh, we have to be very careful about. Um, well, if I may, I think the intent or the intent of referring it to the Transportation Committee is to fully explore that and then the Transportation Committee brings back some suggestions or suggested direction for uh, me and perhaps Trustee Coleman should we move forward with this. Well, and, but subsequent to that, I mean, you are going to be the, uh, yes. uh, the two people that are going to have that discussion. Trustee Coleman, and then well, there, there are a considerable number of other issues that should be raised. Uh, so I, I, I would like to help frame the agenda for the meeting. So my reading of referring it to the transportation committee, I guess I thought perhaps um, the safe routes to school planning and some of these other issues tie in with that part of the strategic plan that would look at a walk. Uh, walking school bus or other programs and talking with the municipal partners in Comox and others about where we would go would fit in under that umbrella of the um, w without committing to spending any money on programming just to explore what that program and what their part of supporting it would look like that that would be something that the transportation committee would do and my I guess my assumption was you're referring it to us to have preliminary meetings with them about those opportunities and that you might you might be opting out and that um, Trustee Coleman would come with transportation committee members to that meeting. I mean, unless we meet with them, we won't be able to come back and give you feedback about what you might talk about when you meet with them. We need to meet first and listen. Mm -hmm. If I could just add, and wherever the board uh, lands on this one would be just fine, but for senior staff, I would I would simply seek some clarification and perhaps just to sort of plant a little seed is that um, uh, appreciating that the council may choose to request that the school district do these things, I would hope that none of those conversations, either the acceptance of that request or the move to transportation committee or whatever are not done without the... Uh, the presence of the school staff administrators and perhaps a staff representative and parents from the school. This is a request from a council. It doesn't necessarily represent the parents or the staff um, or the students of that school. Um, I believe the intent and I understand the spirit of it. It's a, it looks like a problem-solving kind of request from what they in terms of what they believe is a need for that kind of kind of program. But whatever the board decides, I would hope that we that the board would um, choose directions that will include the school administrators from that building, representatives from the parents and staff um, on whatever it is that either the direction is or the resolution is. Because this is one council's assumption that this is this particular strategy is needed. And we have not heard that specifically from that school. Um, I think the transportation is the perfect venue for this letter at the time because we do have senior staff and administrator on, on the transportation committee along with trustees. The chair of the trust, uh, transportation committee can invite other people to come to the meeting and have that conversation. And as this is coming from a council, we've yet request from the schools on that, and I think that conversation starts there <laughs> and then branches further. We've got the ability to have invite guests to have that conversation. The board chair could come also and look at, is this council suggestion or is this real issue within the community? And that will be the perfect place to have the conversation and bring that forward at the next board meeting um, with um, some recommendations or thoughts and going on on that. So I think it's a perfect venue. We can, we've got senior staff, we have director of operations, our secretary treasurer, we have a principal and we have, we can invite parents to attend that also. So I think that's where it's all at the time. And bring, we'll bring back, maybe with coming back to the next board meeting with some sort of what's our next step would be the perfect opportunity, I think, if we can do that. So where I'll come back to the board, we'll have that further conversation. Trustee Green? Yeah, and just a uh, comment with uh, Trustee McDonald. Uh, and I think the walking bus is a great idea, but it's very passive. I mean, it's uh, whoever wants to walk. My concern was maintain a crossing program. That just... When I read this, it just bounced right out, and that's what my concern is. There's an expectation, and, and it's both at uh, Rob Road and uh, uh, 
on Brooklyn School as well. Yeah, I completely agree that they're identifying a solution without discussing what that problem might be, and the Transportation Committee with the partner groups is the place to say, is there an issue, are there actions that we can take collaboratively with partners and do that discussion about what that might look like, rather than leaping to a particular thing and saying, oh, sure, we'll do it. That's more finding out why they feel it's necessary would be a first start. So if I may, my receipt of this letter was simply, I took it simply as an overture from, an honest and straightforward overture from the town of Comox to have a conversation about transportation. And I appreciate that they put in some of their thoughts, and as we do and have done in letters that we send out. And I don't believe that this particularly locks us into conversations specific to these items. It's just the opening salvo in having a good conversation. And I see, I would see that down the road our process is exactly that. It's a process of conversations as opposed to a meeting where we anticipate resolving significant issues. That's just not how it plays out. So I'm hopeful that it can go to transportation for a more complete conversation and be happy to hear back and get some direction or some ideas from the committee as to where to go next. Just as long as I have a chance to show my little video of the daily horror show across the front of Highland School. Anybody who gets to drive through that intersection between 3 and 3.30 will know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't let a lot of... We'll invite you to the transportation committee. Okay. Let's call the question at this point, if I may. So the motion before us is to refer to transportation committee. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay. The next series of correspondence for our similar in theme regarding supervision issues at various schools. We have Tanya Frawley, PAC chair from Brooklyn Elementary. We have Meadow Wood from Cumberland Elementary, also the PAC chair. Marika, and I apologize if I mispronounced that, Tarion, the PAC chair from Quiniche. And Allison Nichols, Nichols, the parent from Rock Road Elementary. You see the... I have a chance to look at the letters. You see the motion that's on the agenda to refer to senior management. I also move that 2A, B, C, and D refer to management as presented. Second. Any discussion? In referring to something, is there a need to make a motion to refer to the secretary and treasurer? Is there a need to make a motion to just refer to something? It's a good way to do it in the sense that it provides for directive to the mayor. Fair enough. So before we do vote on this, because this is an item that has appeared before the board in the past through correspondence and through presentations in the public, I would like to ask for you, Superintendent Elwood, to perhaps ask Mr. Douglas to provide us a... And just before we... I think Director Douglas can give us a bit of an update, but we'd appreciate the opportunity for the board to refer this to senior management because as you read through the letters, even though they are themed in topic, their requests are very different letter by letter. And there's a total of about 28 different requests in this package, all of which we could... It would be disrespectful for us to just respond in a general kind of way. And so what we'd like to be able to do is for you to refer them to senior management and we will produce a report back at the next meeting that is a general topic, but also some of the specifics that are in some of the letters because they ask for some very different kinds of responses of the district to their concerns. And so if you give us that opportunity, we would greatly appreciate that. And just to say that this has been an item on the agenda previously in the last month or so, last two meetings I believe it has been, and it isn't that we haven't been working through these items with principals of schools and perhaps providing some resources initially and then processing some of the suggestions that have either come from senior management and or parents. And so I'll ask Director Douglas to just give us a brief update from the last elementary principals meeting and where we would move 
Were we removing already? Uh, and then, uh, again, uh, your, um, we would appreciate an opportunity for you to refer this to us so we can report back specifically on the request in these letters. Thank you. To you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> we have 15 elementary schools, as you know, and we have been talking about supervision around full day K since we implemented full day K last school year. And the elementary principals meet every single month. And every month, this has been a topic that we have talked about. And, you know, we anticipated there would be a lot of trouble with this. And so the first year, we were mildly surprised to know that it wasn't a big problem at all. And there were other things that were identified as a problem with implementation of full day cake, not supervision. This year, though, it has been identified. And for those schools that have identified, it's a real problem for them. And so one of the things that we have done is we had two schools come forward, uh, two administrators of two of the schools, Cumberland and Ecole Rob Road, saying we need more supervision. And I, and I believe it had to do with the new modulars. They were separate buildings, standalone buildings, and that presented yet another problem because you have another building to supervise. And so in both of those cases, we have put in an extra supervisor. One of the letters in here is from Maida Wood from Cumberland, who's thanking us for that supervision. So we continue, as recently as last Thursday, the 23rd of February, we met with all the principals, and we, I said, you know, I, I anticipate this will come up at the board meeting on Tuesday, and we need to have a big discussion about this and where we're going with this. And every single administrator said, this is not a problem. Okay? This is not a problem. So, you know, we, we talked about um, some of the things as identified in, you know, the previous letters that we had <coughs> around intermediate students, supervising students, uh, the kindergarten children. And we, you know, we were K-6 to for many years in this district. Our grade 5s and 6s were our monitors. Now we have grade five, six, and seven being our monitors. We've had eight supervisors in the schools. Um, I spoke to our principal who was recognized here tonight. He's our, Paul Berry is our district health and safety. I said, in the two years that you've done this, how many reports have we had about incidents around lunchtime? With kids choking or you know, food like that? None. So, we were kind of left like this, to be honest with you, at the end of the meeting. And certainly we can refer and we can talk some more and take a look at this, but um, we, we have a good track record. Now, does that mean that something, you know, could not, you know, could happen? Yes, it probably could. I've been in the district for 32 years as a school principal, and we have not had any incidents at lunchtime around kids choking in those 32 years that I've been there. But it could happen. And so just to conclude, what we're saying is that we're um, going to, this, as I say, when I looked through them and identified how many issues there were and how many requests there were, um, some of, most of them are very familiar. Some of them are already, I think, um, in, the, in the life of the school and perhaps parents were, aren't quite aware of them. If we're actually doing a good job, it should be almost invisible so people don't know but we'll t we, we will continue we've also had acknowledged through this whole thing that one of our major difficulties is um, uh, uh, recruiting and keeping uh, supervisors and it's a QP position um, it's embedded in the life of QP and we, uh, we need we hire them and they're there for noon hour supervision and they that it's it's usually very effective and but our biggest issue has always been is what we we uh, put, we post and post and look and seek people, and we have a hard time uh, recruiting them. And when we and we don't keep them very often, it's only a one hour a, a day job, and they often are, are moving on to something else. So we actually have right now some thoughts and ideas about what we might do around that one, and we'll continue to work on that because if we the more um, permanent noon hour supervisors that we can have on school sites that are familiar with students and understand the culture and the community in their schools, the better off we are. Our problem is we, when we get them, we have a hard time. Um, usually it's an interim job, a bridge to something else for them. And some of the time, is, sometimes it isn't. We just have a hard time hanging on to them, as most districts do across the province. It's a very difficult one, and we're looking at some creative ways that we might be able to um, 
change that and actually um, attract people and keep them um, for longer periods of time. So that's one thing that we're looking at. We are exploring and in conversation uh, with principals um, the, co the conversation around what do we do around kids that are eating and is there a way to embed that in within school time and do something different, have them eat inside first under the supervision of teachers and perhaps go out. There are very, there's a, a multitude of opinions about that one and really there's a split amongst um, folks about whether or not that's an effective use of instructional time and effective use of teacher time. Um, we had actually moved to that model in, in several of the schools as we implemented full day K for in the first original year and schools started from that position and then within about two months maximum in K-3 to three, teachers were saying they don't need to be doing their eating their lunch with a me in the room. They've figured out how to do it. They've understood how it works. They eat really quickly so they go outside and play. Let's be really clear about that. But they've learned how to do that in a, in a safe kind of way and, we, and those schools actually dissolve that, that uh, way of doing it by Christmas break for certain. So we'll continue to work through those, those issues and any other creative solutions we can. And what we'd like to do is address some of the... Um, there are some reasons why we use fives and six, which is historical and experience-based. Uh, one of the letters asked why we don't use grade sevens. Well, there's, there, are, there have been some conscious decisions not to use grade sevens because as they've been the leaders of their schools and they're busy doing student leadership kinds of activities. Uh, the fives and six have always been something that was very successful in the past and continue to be very successful for now. So we can answer some of those things. We will continue to work through this and we'd be happy to report back at the next meeting. But our dilemma is that we have um, some of the suggestions and many of the suggestions we have moved to a place we, we've either tried that and done it and it, it worked effectively so we've kept it or we've tried that done it it didn't work effectively and we've moved on to something different so we'll continue to work at it thank you any additional comments questions so the uh, request is referred to senior managers all those in favor <coughs> That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. And that's the end of our agenda. And we'll move to questions and inquiries. I don't see any hands. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, um, I, like pretty well everybody at the table here this morning, uh, today we're monitoring their blackberries all day as decisions were being made by the Labor Relations Board on the proposal of the teachers and uh, the government's action in the House. Um, so we are all digesting and learning this um, as we go. We had no, obviously, advance notice. Um, and our position as a district when these types of circumstances arise is that we will uh, message as best we can as the information comes available to us, either through the government or through the Teachers Federation. And I can simply, from an operational perspective, are you asking about how do we, you know, what's, what could parents expect? Um, I, can't predict what par I, I can't predict what will happen, but I can tell you that we have done this before. Uh, we will, we have planned accordingly. We have a plan A, a B, a C, and a D, as you would expect. And the most important part of any of our plans will be that we, our messaging has always been the same, is that we will do our very best to communicate with parents. We have uh, two sort of, two of the most reliable mechanisms that we have and the ones that we would hope that parents would pay attention to is that, that the, our website would be the place to go for information as it is about any kind of school closure or district-wide event. And in some cases, this is me predicting, in some cases we might have additional information specifically to schools through our Sinner Voice um, for, uh, system, which that allows um, as messages specifically from schools to go out. Um, and it goes either via telephone and email, but certainly telephone for sure. And sometimes we use that same system to do a district-wide district messaging. It's very effective. So those are the two ways that we would communicate out with parents. We would always, we always encourage parents to use the website. And then if we need detailed kind of more, more detailed kind of information, we may use the voice messaging or email messaging system. But we will have, we'll have plans. We've done this before. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question. Um, do I have to state my name for that part? That would be nice. Possible? Okay. I'm Denise Sanderson, and I teach at Phoenix Elementary. I guess um, 
I might go about in a roundabout way because I've been making notes over the last couple of days, so I hope it comes out clearer than, than what it could. Could I ask one favor? Yeah. Could you start with the question? Sure. So then we know what to listen for when you okay. provide the content. I want to know when the board is planning to stand up to the government and expect money to be put into the education system instead of just accepting what is. We have had cuts for the last 10 years. We've got students that are on designated ministry lists that are expected to be at three maximum. Um, I've got six in my class that are on ministry list. I've got five to six more that need needs. They are limited with the amount of EA support that we've got. As a teacher, we've been making do, and we've been doing the best we can with what we've got for a number of years. But we've got teachers that are on, um, and this is where I get emotional, that are frazzled, that are burnt out, that are um, the demands of their classroom needs are overwhelming, and we care and we're passionate, and we might look at young student teachers that are coming into the profession and they're fresh and they're new, and they've got these needs that are overwhelming. So I guess my bigger question is, what is and when we talked about um, Steve Stanley and asking you know, for the class size and, and what's going to be done about it this year, is my other part to that question is we've got classes that are over limits right now. And what are those, what's being done to, to help out for those teachers that are in those classes that are over Well, I'll speak to the first question, okay. which is the, your, the board standing up to government yeah. question, and perhaps defer the question around the class size to the superintendent, if I may. Um, so the, this board, previous boards, and opportunities that we've had at BCSDA meetings, any opportunities we share the concern of uh, the challenges there within the education system. Um, we recognize, and this, this board recognizes, as do other boards, that it's an exceedingly complex matter. It's not straight, straightforward, it's just the dollars and cents. And there are many, um, many items that are embedded in the active conversations that have gone on between the Teachers Federation and the, and the, and the, uh, and the government. Um, and uh, for, for us as um, as witnesses to that process as opposed to participants in that process for us to try to distill and provide opinion is um, risky because we're not there at the table for those conversations. Um, I think that, uh, that we, we, are, uh, we are aware, um, uh, grudgingly aware, that, uh, that we are in an economic climate um, that has existed for, for some time that has challenged uh, not only education but, but other, other public services. Um, so our, our hope through the process that is beginning to unfold or appears to be unfolding today um, is that there will be opportunities that will allow for, um, for an increased influx. There was a reference to um, some dollars that are being made available to address uh, needs. Does that in and of itself um, satisfy everyone? Unlikely, I don't know, but I assume unlikely. Um, but it's a beginning to the, to the conversation. And if you'd like me just to respond to your the second part, I think, which is about what, what are we doing right now for all the classes that are over limits. I hope I would expect that you would think that we would have a difference of opinion about whether or not we're actually over limits. I think you're talking about Bill 33, the limits set by Bill 33. And if you recall, that whole process is based on our ability to, to, with the resources that we can bring to bear to use those resources to, um, to address those class composition issues. And of course, um, we would diff we would differ that we were have cla we have classes over the limits in the way that you state. We brought every resource that we thought that we could bring to bear at the time. And my superintendent's report at the end of September stated that though the I the learning conditions were not in any way I believed ideal, but with the resources that we had available to us to bring to bear through the Bill 33 consultation process and the assignment of resources that I, I, I signed it at the bottom line and said that it was the appropriate for student learning. And I spoke at the time that I, would, that I wished that we had different resources that we could bring to bear and it wasn't ideal. But I would say to you that I don't believe that we have lots of classes that are over the limits. I believe that we have class composition issues that we would like to address in a different way in a different, in a different budget time. Um, and I'm not certainly, uh, not certainly at all um, understating and not understanding that the, the stresses that that can create in the classroom. Um, but in terms of the numbers of actual classes, we have, we have a continued conversation every month around 
what the details are around that one and what the designations are around that one. And so that's what the arbitrations and the grievance process is on, on Bill 33. And so I would say to you that um, we have a difference of opinion about the numbers of classes that are over the limits. I would prefer, hopefully, and I'm looking forward to some of the pieces of the legislation that I've been able to sort of read today as I was, you know, as, through the course of the day. I'm looking forward to um, the removal of Bill 33, to be truthful, uh, that will, and, getting, and getting us all to a place where we can talk about student learning in classrooms for all students and to make sure that the students with special needs get resources, but also that the learning conditions for all students in the classroom. And I'm hoping that by um, the dissolution of Bill 33 and its aggregate and all the other things that were brought to bear that were so burdensome that we can have much better conversations amongst us, not uh, with me having to fill out check boxes to go to government and you feeling that you needed to be able to find enough kids to be able to have an argument. I think I'd much rather have conversation about what's best for kids in your class um, and the class next door. So if um, I don't necessarily like how it has evolved, but the legislation that I saw today leads me to believe that we might have much better conversations amongst us um, about, about your classroom. Questions? <coughs> yes, My name is Brad Hall. Um, I'm a parent to the point of the kindergarten students at Brooklyn. Um, I'd like to ask the board, to me it seems quite clear, supervision is a problem and it is concerning parents. Uh, so it was expressed that it's, it's not a problem. Um, I've sat with Paul in the uh, school. I've been to several happy meetings where he's been present. That's quite clearly a problem uh, from a perspective. Thankfully, nobody has been hurt to your child's had a problem, but you know, we do have children that have peanut allergies or other allergies that could be very serious problems. Uh, the lunchroom supervision is uh, you know, every 15 minutes, so many things in and what's in as the adults. Uh, there are grade five and six students. For me, if it was my grade five or six student that had been spread by other parents, if something did happen, I'm sure that I want my child to be on the spot. If one of those other kids is having more good reaction and needs a shot in their life in the major, is that a fair thing to do with those students? You know, what, what does the board need to hear from parents or from whoever to, to make this an issue? You know, it's been expressed. From the beginning of the school year that I'm aware of, I'm new to the district, so I don't know if it was expressed last year or not, but I know for sure this year we've been expressing it right from the beginning of the year. I know it was expressed by a former uh, board member uh, as an issue closer to the beginning of the year. So, what, what will it take for the board to take the issue seriously? So, thank you for the question. Um, um, I, I apologize. Uh, on behalf of the board, if we're suggesting that we're not taking it seriously or that we're uninterested, we're in fact very much interested and, and, and recognize that it's a that it's been an issue that's gone on for some time. I think, and, and I won't fully speak for Director Douglas, but I think his how I heard his comments around not an issue was the conversation that he had with with his administrators from their their perspective. Um, and that doesn't devalue, in my view, the perspective that parents have brought forward in correspondence and submissions here um, through questions um, um, at, at the board meeting. Um, so our interest is to provide um, some clarity to be able to uh, provide some direction um, as we move forward for individual school sites or on the, on the aggregate or whatever makes sense um, as we move forward. So the re refer to senior management isn't um, as it may appear, a sloughing off of, uh, we'll just slide it off. The expectation is that there will be a report that comes back to the board that provides some, some context and, um, and clarity to the issues that were raised, not only from uh, the PAC chair from the school that, that your child attends, but um, also from, from other schools who are referenced here, and, and we know that there are others through the DPAC conversations that ever have also spoken to similar concerns. Well, I guess there's a, a disparity because there are you know, support goals was brought up earlier and there was some provision added that uh, one of the schools, uh, Rob Road, I think, 
where they do have an adult that supervises lunch the entire time. So I guess would the board like to be in a situation where something happens at a different school where there isn't adult supervision? You know, that looks, that doesn't look very good. If one school has something and the other school is not getting the same treatment, the other is not getting the same treatment, is that appropriate? It doesn't seem appropriate from my perspective. Yeah, I think that, I mean, the question will be, do we do a cookie-cutter approach to managing supervision? Does it need to look all the same for all school sites? And to some degree, that's a discussion that is alive and well with PACs and with school administrators. On the question of, on the point of, you know, how would the board feel, I think as a parent or as a board member, we don't go looking for something bad to happen. We're grateful as Director, Director. Douglas. See, it's the Lord Douglas thing. No, it's Inspector. I always want to call him Inspector anymore. Director Douglas said that over the past 30-plus years, we haven't had an incident. Again, does that preclude that there isn't the possibility of something happening? Of course, it can never preclude that. Is there a way for the board to take a more aggressive stance? I appreciate that it's being referred to senior management, but can the board not take a little more aggressive stance and ask that the solution is put in place, that does allow for kindergarten students? You're talking about four-year-olds. In many cases, that there is an adult supervising them all the time. But I think a four-year-old, you know, with my grade five students by themselves out on the street, it wouldn't be looked on very favorably. So why is there a game of basketball? Chickens for the report. So in terms of the request is, can the board tonight say, but what we're asking, so the answer to that is no. Right, but the request is. This has been an issue. I guess I'd like to see the board be more aggressive about it. I appreciate that it's being referred to senior management. That's great. The report will come back in another month. It's gone by or six weeks or however long it's going to take. It's concerning, you know, that something doesn't happen a little more aggressively. I don't personally know what the rules would be in a daycare, but, you know, for a four-year-old in a daycare, would they be allowed to be unsupervised? Would there be times where it was okay for an adult to be in that room? And so if it's not okay there, it shouldn't be okay in a public school. So I appreciate your comments. It will come back to the next board meeting in March with a report and, again, the expectation that there would be recommendations from senior management that then the trustees will debate and you and others will be able to judge whether we're on it or not. So thank you. Well, the same subject, you know, supervision. I'm from DPAC, and one of the things that we were kind of thinking of was not just a solution for each and every school, but actually going back to the policy which every school follows, which I think is a few years out of date. And basically it shows minimum numbers of supervisors for the different school sizes. So I think that's one way to do a permanent solution. Possibly also it would be a possibly aesthetic policy for fully kindergartens and being just that much younger for adults. So I'd like to see the policy committee look at that and look at all the correspondence from the schools and maybe look at some minimums. So that's going to impact the budget, obviously, financially. But I think it's – and I don't think it's just a measure of not having any choking incidents. It's also to do with kids' comfort, noise levels, and allergy risks. Maybe no one's choked, but I'm not sure if that's the measure of success for adequate supervision. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. One more question. Had this been referred to policy earlier? I thought that something like this may have gone to policy and the committee wants to stop doing this. So I thought that this had possibly gone to policy already and there hasn't been anything back on it. That's correct. It is before the policy. Policy. So, again, I'd 
reiterate from a parent's perspective, from having kids in kindergarten, is there not something before it can be exacerbated? It is that policy committee, and we'll have a report back from senior management. So that will be the next? That's the next public board meeting. Okay. I have another one, but this one's not for you. Sorry. My question is for the board. If you've had any indication from the government regarding what this school board will be doing or what other school boards will be doing regarding the Supreme Court class size and composition ruling that had until April 30th to be fixed and to be fulfilled by this year. I would say that you're aware, the BCTF is aware as much as we are. You have the same information we have, which is that the legislation that was tabled today, the Education Improvement Act, sorry, Bill 22, contains information about Bill 27 and Bill 28, and it is the government's response to the judge's ruling that something had to be done before April 13th. So it's on the website. It's on the TF website, I would suspect. So that's my, and I've read it, like, very quickly because there's stuff coming all day. And as I shared with trustees, that there's two portions to that, Bill 22. The significant meat inside that is around the government's response to Bill 27 and Bill 28. So is Bill 22 replacing Bill 27? You know what? That's a government, right now, and it's just been placed on the table. I would say to you that I'm trying to, I've read it so very quickly. I would say to you that Bill 22 will answer that it is the government's response to the court challenge of Bill 27 and 28. I'm not enough of a parliamentarian to know those bills inside out. There may be still bits and pieces left over from Bill 27 and 28 that stand. I don't know enough about that. But I would say to you that that's what I know today at this point in time at 830, because it's been one of those days, every hour, you know, there's something new has come out, that I would point you to that piece, and I'm sure you have it on the BCTF website. And the board had no advanced knowledge of anything that happened today, so we're learning and reading about it at the same pace as everybody else. Okay. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.